But believe me, there's a lot of math in the magic trick I'm going to show you. Okay, are you guys ready? Are you seriously ready? Okay, so let me just explain. Look at this. Count to three. One, two, three. Wow. <laughs> oh yeah, there's a lot of math in there. No, don't hold it on the Don't he just push the button? <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three. When you say three, I will push I have to say it. Oh, wow. I was just trying to engage you guys, but in the end, it's really I have to say it. See? You, you can say it four, five, six, okay? Okay, I'll say one, two, three. Okay. Go ahead. One, two, three. See, when I say one, two, three, it works. Okay. All right, so there was a question over the break. Why is this the formula for the first derivative? Where is that coming from? Okay, let me show you. If you remember, we did the first derivative of x squared by starting from this formula. This is pretty much the definition of the first derivative. We applied that formula on a special case of x squared, and we got 2x. And we applied the same formula or the same definition on x cubed, and we got 3x squared. But where is that definition coming from? Okay, if I tell you, I want you to draw or equivalent, you know, in math, drawing a picture is equivalent to writing the equation. So I can also write you to write an equation of a line that has slope a, maybe in this example we can say slope 2, and it has y-intercept, let's say, 3. How would you do it? In terms of drawing, you would 1, 2, 3, okay, so here, that's where your line is crossing the one in the direction of x, we go two in the direction of y. Okay, so this is the line. How would we write an equation, the equivalent thing? Well, we would say, okay, y equals two, three is the intercept, that's when x is equal to zero, and then we add two x to that. This is the equation. Okay, so given the slope, given the intercept, I can draw the, the line, or I can write an equation. Let's look at a different example. What if I tell you, give me an equation, or draw a line through the following points? Okay. Let's say I have point A with coordinates, let's say, 1,
and we are getting closer to what I'm aiming at. Look, this is y equals, I'll move y1 to the other side, then I'll have a fir another free term due to this negative x1 times this, y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. I don't really care about that part at this point. This is what I care about. Plus x times this term here, y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. This is really my slope here. This is my a when we write, where is my equation? When we write y equals ax plus b. Okay? This is my a, this is my b here. This is my slope. Why is this important? We are just one step away from that formula over there. Look, if I have a curve like this, this is my y, this is my x. If I have a curve like that, and I want to draw a tangent through this line, okay? What if I start from a line defined by two points like here? Okay, this is a tangent, the tangent line, and you have a line going through two points of your curve, this is called a secant. Okay, if this here is my x1, if this here is my x2, if this here is my y1, if this here is my y2. So these are points A and B. I can get the equation of the tangent by having A and B come closer and closer to each other, converging on this point in the center. Okay. Another way to do it is just to put A right here where I want my tangent, so I'm going to put it here, and A will have coordinates x and y, and B is approaching it from the right, so it's going to be B with coordinates x plus some really small h, and then the value of the function will be y of x plus h, and this here is the value y of x, okay? So my slope is really what I have up there. Um, look, I'm converging with these two points, and if I want to see the slope of this tangent, it's going to be equal to the ratio of these two segments. This vertical segment will be y of x plus h, minus y of x, it's this segment here, divided by this segment here. That segment is x plus h minus x. x and x cancel each other, and I'm left just with, that, with h. That's what we have over there. So that's where this is coming from, okay? Are you guys scared? or this makes sense. This all comes from the world of analyzing curve shapes in 16th and 17th century. People were really interested in all kinds of different curves. Cycloids, cardioids, that's the curve that looks like a car. Uh, all kinds of different shapes in uh, your two dimensions. And they analyzed their slopes and they realized also if they want to maximize something, Look at this curve here. Let this curve be given by y of x, okay? This is y of x. When does it reach its peak here? How can we figure that out analytically, mathematically? Well, people said, okay, let's look at these tangents, okay? This tangent is like this. When we are looking at the tangent in that peak, the tangent is going to be horizontal, which means that the slope 
y prime of x will be equal to 0. Aha, uh -huh. that's an equation. Maybe we know how to solve the equation. And by solving the equation for the first derivative or for the slope, we can find these extremal points, minima, maxima, and there are some others, the uh, saddle points and stuff like that. So we'll look at it, an example really quick. Anyway, the world of tangents, tangent lines, line equations, that's what leads us to this definition of the first derivative. Okay. Any questions or comments? Not even Jeffrey. Okay, good. So again, for y equals to x cubed, we apply the same definition, and we got that the first derivative of y cubed is 3x squared. Okay, let's see how we can apply the first derivative to do some interesting plots. And even though I work for Texas Instruments, I don't want you to use a graphing calculator right now. I want you to try to figure this problem without the calculator, just based on your math skills. So at this point, no need for calculators. Maybe in school, I don't know what kinds of math to do at school and needs the calculator, but for this, we don't need the calculator. Let's look at the curve described by the following x minus 1 times x plus 1 times x plus 2. Uh, any volunteers to help me get rid of these parentheses? Uh, is that even what it says? Do I have it there somewhere? Oh, thank you. Well, I was just testing if Jeff is paying Okay. Was that really your point? Of course not. Uh, so, anyone wants to help me get rid of these parentheses? Okay, what's your name back there? Amit. Okay, Amit, help us. Okay, that gives us. Okay. First. First two times the x squared plus x. Okay, so x cubed plus 2x squared. What else? Okay, is that it? Everybody agrees with this? Yes. Okay, so we have two ways to write this function. One is useful for some reasons, the other form is useful for other reasons. If I want to plot a graph of this, okay, so this is x, this is y. This is my 0 here, let's say this is 1, 2, 3, and this here is negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. Let's see what happens. When is this function equal to 0? Yeah, don't just read it there. Explain it to me. Jeffrey? Well, when, uh, if it touches at 1, negative 1, or negative 2, the turning points are... Okay, wait a second. Let's talk about zeros. So tell me again, how do we know the zeros? Because uh, they didn't get to give this out in expanded form, so it's really easy to tell. Oh, yeah, so that form, the first form here, it's really useful to find the zeros. The whole function is going to be equal zero to zero when either one of these is zero. So Adam, for example, when is this going to be equal to zero? When x is one, this one when x is, and this one. Okay, so we have three zeros. One is here, another one is here, another one is here. Okay? Now, we can really quickly figure out that the function goes, look at my pen. 
I'm not going to draw it just yet. It goes like this, like this, and like this. How do I know that? Because it crosses the x axis only in those three points. Correct? Is that what you meant, Rich? Yeah. But how do I know it doesn't go like this? How do I know for sure that it goes like this? Because look at what happens when x is a huge positive number. When x is a huge positive number, this is huge positive, huge positive. OK, this diminishes it a little bit, but this really dominates the whole thing. So when x is a huge positive number, x cubed dominates the whole thing, and it's a huge number somewhere here. Okay, It goes like that. For x in the negative, x getting to negative infinity, this term again dominates. And negative infinity to the power 3, it's also negative infinity. So it must be going somewhere here. That's how I know, OK? So now I can connect, connect the dots, OK? Something like this, like this, like this, and it goes there. For function, but we'll find a little bit more. Adam. To find a little bit more, you might be able to find the saddle points, which um, if you just derive the function. Okay, so I don't think we'll have any saddle points, but we'll have these extremal points. This will be a maximum and this will be a minimum. Right. Yeah. So, how do we do that? We said that these extremal points are characterized by having a tangent that's horizontal which means that the slope right there is equal to zero. And the slope is the first derivative. Yes, the slope is the first derivative. So let's look at that. What is y prime of x? The first derivative of x cubed was 3x squared, right? Plus, what is the first derivative of x squared? Two. What is the first derivative of just x? If you apply, I mean, one. That's right. With this negative sign, it becomes negative one. What is the first derivative of a constant, Adam? Zero. Zero. Why? Because a constant has a graph like this for any x. It's a constant thing. What is its slope? It's zero. OK, I'll just say minus zero. This is my first derivative. And if I want to determine where this function makes these turns, like this, and then makes a turn like that, I can simply say, let me solve the following equation. Y, of x, y prime of x equals to zero. OK. Jeffrey's going to solve this for us. I solved it. Negative 2 plus minus 2 sub over 3. OK. And do we have those numbers there? No. OK. So let's see. 3x squared plus 4x minus 1 equals No. Parents included. <laughs> Okay. I don't know. Okay, then I'm gonna, not going to ask you, but in red shirt, your name is? Andrew? Yeah. Okay, so help me out. What is the solution of this quadratic equation? I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Negative B. Uh -huh. Negative B is? Negative 4. Uh-huh. Plus or minus square root of B squared, which is 16. Minus 4ac, a is 3, and b is 2. Okay, so it's going to be plus 12 divided by 2a, which is 6. Okay, and I think, yeah, it's going to be 28. It's not going to be a pretty number, but x1 will be equal to, and x2 will be equal to anyone. Jeffrey, do you have a numeric value? 
the numeric value. Uh -huh. You just simplify that to negative 4 plus minus 2 root 7 plus 6, which can be simplified even further to negative 2 plus minus root 7 over 3. Okay, and roughly the numbers are? Um, decimals? Yeah. Well, around like 0 0.1. Okay, 0 0.1, and the other one is? I think it's negative 155. Okay, so we can actually be quite accurate with this. If we calculate these to a few decimal places, we can say where these turning points or these extremal points are. And uh, you know, things like this can be important. If, you, if you're running a business and uh, you need to order some materials, different mixes for your concrete or something, and uh, maybe you can figure out the best cost option you have by writing a little equation and it gives you the extremal point and you save a little bit of money. Why not? Or if you're working on a physics problem where it asks you to maximize you know, cannonball is shooting and how to maximize the distance and so on. Okay? So these things can be used in many different places. All right, so let's see. Where are the turning points? Where the slope is zero? Okay. Now, what about this? What if I tell you find the extremal points of this function? Now, we know the graph of this looks like this, right? So obviously, the extremal point is at x equals to 0. How would you do that with the first derivative? Rich, how would you do this with the first derivative? Jeffrey? Wouldn't you um, split it into like two sides? One is going to be the left, the other is going to be the right. Okay, so the first derivative on this side is always negative one, right? And the first derivative on this side is always one. Is it ever zero, Adam? Well, it might be at the very bottom point where the tangent is going to be on the origin. Mm, no. If you think about it, the function looks like this. It's really pointy here, so be careful. Okay. Um, the tangents are in any point are like this here for negative x, and the tangents are always like this for positive x. And for x equal to zero, there's really no single tangent. Because you can draw a tangent like this, like this, like this. They will always start just one, line, one point of that line. So the tangent is really not well defined at this point. And if you ask what's the value of the first derivative when x is equal to 0, I would have to say I don't know. It's not well defined. So even though it's obviously the minimum is that x equals to 0, in this case we cannot use the first derivative to find it. And there are cases like that. You have to be careful. The extremal point of a curve, you can find it when the first derivative is 0, but it also might be hiding in places where the first derivative does not exist. And this is like a prime example of that. <clears throat> OK? So if I give you a function like this, and there's nothing wrong with this function. If I give you a function like this, maybe at this section it's a part of a parabola, okay? And then here I make it a part of a line. And then here I make it another part of a line, and so on, okay? And let's continue this one. point, it's a minimum, and I would like to get this point, it's a maximum. You can try to write the first derivative, and the first derivative equals to zero 
will give you only this point here because the first derivative is well defined there. The first derivative is not going to give you this point except by saying, hey, I'm not really defined at this point. Also, this point doesn't have a well-defined first derivative. So we need to check those points in a special, in a manual fashion, OK? And then this one is not going to turn to be a maximum, but this one will. So there are multiple candidates for extremal points, the ones where the first derivative is 0, and the ones where the first derivative does not exist. OK? Any questions or comments about this? Now, if the first derivative is 0, do we know if it's minimum or maximum? Could it be something else? Yes. What do we know, Jeffrey? Well, for parabolas, it would definitely have a minimum or maximum. Well, if the parabola is y equals x squared plus bx plus c rather than x equals ay squared plus bx plus c, because that's sideways. And then um, for like cubics, um, it's only at the turning points where there's ver uh, the vertex of like these mini parabolas inside. Okay, so let's look at one, the simplest one, the simplest cubicle. It looks like this. Okay. And this is y equals x cubed. Does this cubic have a minimum or a maximum, Adam? Um, no, but this is a saddle point. It has a saddle point. This is called a saddle point. And keep in mind, this point will also have a tangent that's horizontal, meaning the first derivative is 0. But it's neither minimum nor maximum. Jeffrey? If there's a double root, then uh, it's going to be changed to Yeah, double roots, yeah, they, they are the places where we have to be careful. And here is why, okay? If we find all the points where the first derivative is 0, let's say the list is points x1, x2, and so on. We have to check the value of the second derivative in these points. So we take the derivative of this again. And that will indicate to us if it's greater or less or equal to 0. This is my special notation. You're not going to find this in any books or in LaTeX, I don't think. Uh, here is what it means, OK? OK, this should be nice, like this. If the second derivative is greater than 0, we have a minimum. If it's less than 0, we have a maximum. And then if it's equal to 0, the second derivative if it's equal to 0, we have to look further. And maybe we'll cover that in one of the future presentations here. But at this point, let's just say if the second derivative is 0, there are all kinds of options that are still open. It could still be a minimum, it could still be a maximum, or it could be a saddle point. Okay, we have to do some more investigation. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. So let's see. For our parabola, y equals x squared, the simplest one. <coughs> So y equals x squared, and it looks like this. It touches the x-axis here. This is x, this is y, this is y equals x squared. Okay? The first derivative of this is, we said, 2x, okay? In order to find the extremal points, we say y prime of x equals 0, which gives us 2x equals 0, which tells us the only candidate is x equals to 0. And uh, of course, we know it's a minimum, but let's follow the recipe here. What is the second derivative? It's really the first derivative of the first derivative. 
What is the first derivative of 2x, Adam? Um, two. two, because the first derivative of x itself is 1 times 2, that's 2. Is that greater, equal, or less than 0? It is greater than 0. Therefore, x equals to 0 is a, a minimum. That's how it works even in much more complicated cases. Okay? All right, let's see what else we have. Oh, okay, here are the numerical results. Remember when we were plotting x minus 1 times x plus 1 times x plus 2? We got this form here. The first derivative is that. When you say, I want to see all points where the first derivative is 0, you get a quadratic equation. OK, that's OK. And uh, we get those values. All right. So the first derivative has a bunch of useful rules that, uh, OK, I think I missed. can be written as a weighted sum of some simpler functions. Like, for example, when we wrote our polynomials, we already used this linearity. Okay, Adam, give me a third-order polynomial. Um, y equals to, give me something. Y equals to 3x cubed plus, plus Squared, Jeffrey, give me something else. Zero x. <laughs> zero x? Yeah. Okay, I'll make it 0 0.1x, okay? okay? Plus 3. Plus negative 3. Plus negative 3. Okay, look, we, we can use linearity to figure this one out. y prime of x, so this is y of x, this is y prime of x. We know the first derivative, okay, look at the rule there. If your function y of x is equal to a, a some kind of constant, times function u of x plus b, another number, times v of x, then the first derivative, y prime, is a times u prime plus b times v prime, okay, and so on. So. We know that the first derivative of this guy is 3x squared. And multiply by 3, you get 9x squared. Plus, again, by linearity, we can look at this as our v over there. And this is v. So it will be 21 times 2, which is 42x, and so on. The first derivative of x is 1, so this is plus 0, 1. And minus 3, it's a constant. The first derivative of that is just 0. So this is our first derivative. That's how we use linearity. The product rule is a little bit more complicated. If your function, y of x, consists of a product of two functions, <coughs> then the first derivative, y prime, as written over there, is u prime v plus u v prime. And uh, there is a similar rule for <coughs> division of two functions. If your function is a quotient, like there, y is u over v, and both u and v are functions of x, then that formula over there is what we need. So let's try those few. How would you read this? Exercises? Exercises. Exercises? OK, let's try these exercises. <laughs> I mean, do you have a question? OK. Anybody else has a question or a comment? 
Okay, go get them. Those four over there. Exorcists. Come on, guys. I need to see you riding. I need to see your head steaming. Yeah, I was already done like before you even started. <laughs> even before I flipped to this slide, right? Uh, like right. <laughs> okay. I believe you. Yes. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering if how was how you like extra and Okay, so let's see. That's a complicated thing. <coughs> How do we do the first derivative of this? <coughs> Adam? Well, you would, well, you multiply x by x to the power of x minus 1, which is basically just x dx. So the first you're all going to do it. Okay, let's, let me think about this. And in the meantime, you guys look at those four, okay? Jeffrey, can you help with this? Oh uh, well, should we just use like the regular uh, ax times like ax to the power of n minus one? No, because this assumes that a is a is a constant number. Yeah, I think I'll think. That, yes, you have a solution already. Maybe we can. Um, Okay, so you're saying let's look at z, which is ln of y, which is x ln x, and the first derivative of z would be easy to figure out from that. It would be 1 times ln x plus x times 1 over x, which is just 1. And then what do we do next? OK, so really we have y is equal to e to the power z. OK, and then we can apply our formula there. Yeah, we can do it like this, because this becomes a composite function, and we have a way to handle that. So yeah, this is a good approach. This is a good approach. OK, anyone wants to give me the solutions for exercises? OK, let me see anyone else. Come on, people. I see always the same people here. <laughs> OK. OK, so Jeffrey, tell me the first one. It's like, if I didn't know this, it was 15x to the 4 plus 4. OK, so we need to figure out x to the power of 5. The first derivative of that is 5x to the 4 multiplied by 3. That's 15 times x to the power of 4 plus 4, plus four because the first derivative of x is just 1. OK. What about the second one, Amit? OK, let's see why. I think you're right, but let's see why. OK, so y of x equals tangent of x, which is really sine of x divided by cosine of x, right? And we use the rule of quotients, right? OK? So this is our u of x, this is our v of x. And the rule says the following, y prime is equal to u prime v minus u v prime divided by v squared. Okay, 
Who's going to help me with U prime? How much is U prime? U is sine of x. Other than the three people who always participate. I need more people. Say it again. Okay, so cosine of x. And I just copy V, and V is cosine of x, okay? Minus U, I'll copy U, which is sine of x. Okay, times negative sine x. The first derivative of the cosine is negative sine, correct? Okay, so this makes it a cosine squared x plus sine squared of x. And that's the famous Adam's favorite formula, right? Okay, how much is cosine squared plus sine squared? One. One, yes, so this here is one. What do we have in the denominator? We have this thing squared, cosine squared x. Therefore, the solution is 1 over cosine squared x, or somebody said secant squared, right? Secant squared x. X. Yeah, I, I would be happy with this. Okay? I use math a lot, but I really never use secants. Has anyone used sequence a lot in their career? I honestly don't know why <laughs> we teach them in schools, but that's okay. We teach. Yeah. Because the other three trigonometry functions are just the circles. Okay. Uh, what about the third example? We did it already, right? The first derivative of e to the power x is Chuck Norris himself, right? How about this one? Uh, Any volunteers other than Jeffrey, Amit, and Adam? How do you still remember our names? What's difficult about remembering people's right. names? Well, let me take a, should I take a guess. No, I said except Jeffrey, Amit, <laughs> and Adam. Okay. You know, except it's like everybody, Jeffrey. <laughs> except means everybody. Except Jeffrey, okay? <laughs> and except Adam, and except Amit. Okay. <clears throat> Volunteers, don't make me call you. Help the others. And your name is? Say it again. Say that again. Anirud. Okay, thank you. Are you guys brothers? No. Okay. Okay, very good. Okay, so help me out with the last one. So first, tell me which rule are we going to use here? The rule of product, okay, so y of x is x times e to the power x, and uh, we will call this u, and we'll call this v, okay? And tell me now, y prime is equal to, say it again, 1 times, I'll just copy e to the power x plus, X times Chuck Norris, <laughs> which is e to the power x times 1 plus x. You agree with this? Anybody disagrees with this? No. Okay, thank you. Um, what time do we have? X. How much? Okay. <coughs> Okay, let me ask you this trick question, and this will be the last thing for today. <coughs> if my function, if my function is y of x equals x squared times Chuck Norris. Okay, okay, no more Chuck Norris. 
Um, how do I do this one? Okay, you would call u of x what? x squared, and v of x is? Okay, and the solution will be, I'll do it quickly. The first derivative of this is 2x times e to the power x plus x squared e to the power x. So the solution is e to the power x times x squared plus 2x. Or maybe we can say x, e x, uh, x plus 2. Okay. Now, am I going to make a mistake if I say my u of x is going to be just x and my v of x is going to be x e, e to the power x? Yes. Will that be incorrect? No. Yes? No? The actual might. No. Yes? Correct or incorrect? Well, let me check. I'm going to solve this out on group four. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's see. But yeah, the whole it is correct. Solved. It is going to be correct, except that it's going to be a little bit more complicated. Let's see why. Y prime will be the first derivative of u is just 1 times, I'll copy this, plus. I'll copy u, which is x, times the first derivative of this guy. Fortunately, we already have it here, right? But imagine we didn't have it here. You would have to apply the product rule again on this case and get that. And then when you figure it all out, it's e to the power x times x here, x here, that's 2x, x squared here. That's the same thing, right? So it's not going to be incorrect, but it's going to be a little bit more a lengthier derivation. But nothing wrong with it. Okay? Any questions about this? Okay, so let me recap really quick what we did today. We looked at infinite processes, infinite sums, infinite products. Some of them ended up being really nice numbers like 2, pi, pi over 4, pi squared over 6, and so on. Some of them, even though they looked like they would be a finite number like the harmonic series, they ended up being infinitely large, okay, divergent. We looked at tangents of various curves and said that you know, these tangents are really useful because you can identify the minimum and the maximum of these curves by saying that the tangent is horizontal. Okay? And that's how we came to first derivatives. We looked at that equation of a line through two points, and when those two points lie on a single curve and they get closer and closer together, you really get the first derivatives definition. The thing with h, where h goes to zero. Okay, and then we apply that definition to some simple functions, x squared, x cubed, and then we jumped and said, okay, other people have done this before, and we will do it in a few years when we study this seriously. But now let's just skip right into that and say that you know x to the power a gives you that, and so on. We got this little table of derivatives. And we talked about some of the properties of derivatives, and we were able to figure out derivatives of much more complicated functions, like what we saw there. And uh, this is not the end of the story, however. As you saw, Amit asked me about x to the power x. I was a little bit rusty. I couldn't really remember exactly how to do it. But what he suggested, the ln of that, and then going back, that requires composite functions. So this is just the beginning of that story, okay? Don't think that now you know calculus, but you got the first encounter with it, okay? And um, maybe in a month or so we'll talk about it. Maybe we'll have another lecture on calculus, which will include integration. We'll talk about Leibniz and Newton, how they fought about who was the first, who discovered it about Archimedes, who actually was the first to discover it, but we didn't know that until recently. 
And uh, there are a, a lot of interesting stories about calculus. Okay, before I finish, Jeffrey has a comment or a question? Oh, is, is the next one going to be called well, second account calculus online? You know, maybe we can call it the third, or it will be the fourth for you. So maybe we can call it the fourth encounter for Jeff. <laughs> yes, maybe we can do it like that. Anyway, so today we covered a lot of ground. If you go to take an AP course in calculus, you will take this really step by step, much more serious. This was just the first dive. Thank you.